it, fat boy! Peter Cairns, welcome to the Sure It Fat Boy podcast. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. How was your drive down here? Yeah, straightforward. Roads are empty. Uh, hills are full of snow, so no bother. Good. Nice and safe yeah. there. Great. And whereabouts are you based? So, yeah, I live up a, a pretty remote Glen, Glen Feshi, which is, which is near King Craig, uh, seven miles north of King UC, seven miles south of Aviemore. So, yeah, it's a nice spot in the middle of the Cairngorms. So it's in the Cairngorms Yeah, itself. absolutely. Uh, oh, we're wow. just on the sort of southwestern edge of the National Park. So, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that I'm interested in going on there. So, yeah. yeah. It's good. Lovely place. So I was looking through a bunch of stuff. You're involved in so many things. I suppose my beginning is probably quite a long way back uh, compared to your beginning. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, it's very simple, really. I'd, I'd left school. Uh, I was playing in a band at the time, having great fun. We were going to be the next ACDC. That clearly Sounds didn't work good. out. It sounded good, but it didn't work <laughs> out. Um Got a job as, a, as an HGV driver, did that for 12 years, um, went on holiday to Africa in 92, I think it was. Long story short, came back, thought, I'm going to be a wildlife photographer. Um, that was Whereabouts in Africa did you? We were in the, it was just, we just, I'd not been on holiday for a long time, picked sure. up a brochure, finger on the page, Maasai Mara, met a wildlife photographer out there, thought this looks great. Um, yeah. So yeah, fast forward another year or so and I was I was in the Cairngorms and and. And I, I kind of went, well, I use the word professional lightly, but I, I kind of went freelance in 99. So 20, 20 odd years. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's really cool. You just went there. Oh, that's what I'm doing now and got started. That's yeah. quite a change around from just lorry driver to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, it, I just came to a, a, a crossroads in my life. My, sure. my, my wife was, was pregnant with our son at the time. And it was just, it just brought us to a natural sort of T junction. Right. Um, yeah, flipped a and coin. And had you done any photography before that? I was interested in photography, not not to any great degree. I mean, no. I mean to be honest, I I don't really look upon myself as a as a photographer in the maybe in the traditional sense. I mean, all the the technical stuff, the sure. gear that that all bores me senseless. Yeah, I think what I'm really interested in is what photography can do. Yes. As, as a tool, as a mechanism. Yeah. Um. So over the years, I suppose I've become a without sounding pretentious, a sort of visual storyteller. Right. Using photography, mm -hmm. but photography itself is just the mechanism. It's just of the course. tools. I suppose if I'm honest, I was a bit of a trophy hunter. You know, I, right. I travelled the world taking pictures of the the sort of charismatic animals, polar yeah. bears, tigers. All of these sorts of things, you know, calendar covers really is right. what, what I what I was yearning to to, uh, to to collect. Things changed over a period of time. I kind of wanted to get into things a little bit deeper. I was interested in conservation, wanted to start using photography as a, as a conservation tool. The industry itself changed beyond recognition. Mm -hmm. I, I suppose there are parallels with the music industry. I remember yeah. when bands used to go out on tour to sell an album. Yeah. And now, of course, the albums are, are virtually worthless. Yes. And they go out on tour to effectively sell themselves. Yes. And photography is the same. You know, there's no money anymore in, in the imagery, in the product yes because there's just so much of it mm -hmm. um so most photographers i know and i i just happen to be a, an early adopter of the of the tourism um, product but most photographers i know are now running holidays workshops right um, using their skills using their skills and their knowledge and, and yeah. perhaps in some cases their profile but yeah the 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 product the imagery they produce is is worthless it's just so, not worth that's so it's changed changed completely but you know you can either lament that or you can see it yeah, as an opportunity exactly so. and so you're also, from the, what I was reading as well, you're involved the uh, Wild Media Foundation you were involved in, which done the Tooth and Claw yep. and uh, the Highland Tiger. Yeah. Am I that right? Yeah. Uh, and 2020 Vision. What, what, what did that entail? So this was myself um, and my business partner. Um, I suppose this would be, what, 20, 2006? Again, recognizing that the industry was changing, recognizing the model that had fed us up until that time, and, mm -hmm. and it really coincided with the digital revolution, was no longer viable. So we, we started to look at how we could use our very limited skills and, and sure. aspirations to to come at it from a slightly different angle. So we, we came up, well, I say we came up with the, we, we pursued this idea of conservation yeah. visual storytelling. So we formed a, 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 a effectively a non-profit social enterprise um, and we did about five big conservation media projects, mainly around photography, but also involving video and, and, yeah. and in some cases music as well, multimedia, 
So Tooth and Claw was a project about predators, which is what got me into wolves. Mm -hmm. um, went on to do Highland Tiger, which was all about Scottish wildcats. Um, a big European-wide um, conservation media project called Wild Wonders of Europe. Mm -hmm. Then on to 2020 Vision. And, and the latest sort of iteration of that idea, that philosophy, that model is Scotland the Big Picture, which is what I'm involved with now. So I went on Scotland the Big Picture website. And the first thing I noticed was it was said up in the corner, it said, think like a mountain. Mm. Is that, what, what, what does that entail? Well, I think, you know, in this country, it's a, it's a, it, we're, an odd, we're an odd nation in many ways because we're, so, you know, we're one of the most wealthy and best educated countries in the world. Yeah. You could argue we're one of the most conservation-oriented companies in the world. You know, the likes of the RSPB, you've got over a million yep. members, et cetera, et cetera. And yet, somehow, we've become one of the most nature-depleted countries in the yeah. world. And and not the only reason, but part of the reason for that, I think, is that conservation for the last 30, 40, 50 years really has revolved around picking out individual animals and, and trying to save them. Red squirrels, hedgehogs, yep. water voles, whatever it happens to be, or fragments of habitat. So it's a very piecemeal approach yeah. to saving the world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Think Like a Mountain really is a philosophy that was developed by a, an American hunter turned conservationist called Aldo Leopold, who started, and he, again, he was only one of, of, of several pioneers. John of Muir, of course, was, was a, was a yeah. Scot that emigrated to America. He was, a, again, an mm -hmm. early ecological thinker. And it was really about putting aside this idea that nature is made up of, of individual components. And actually, no. it's a system. It's an, e it's it's an, an engine. E yeah. and, and really, think like a mountain is to try, is, is a, you know, we use it as a hashtag, but it's an encouragement to think out of the box beyond these isolated yeah. pockets of nature mm -hmm. to the bigger picture and, yeah so and that's sort name. of the a, a big overview if you're standing over exactly. the mountain you're seeing everything yeah and, and it's really about recognizing that nature is more of a system than 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 individual component parts okay. and, and recognizing how the that system into you know is interdependent and interreliant on all the all the bits within it if you like sure so, yeah. sure and what is it you i mean i read some of your vision could you maybe just explain what Scotland Big Picture's vision is going forward? First of all, you've, we've kind of got to get our heads around how the, the, prob the problem in many ways, yeah. I guess, in, in Scotland is that, and it's an irony in many ways, is that most people see it as a beautiful, pristine almost, natural, yes. wild country. And, and there's no doubt about it that, you know, Scotland is a beautiful and dramatic place. But yes. actually... In ecological terms, it's it's massively depleted. So right. I think first of all, we've got to get past this perception that all is well. Yes, because it isn't. You no. know, we've lost all our large carnivores, most of our large herbivores, yep. and as I say, we spend our time desperately trying to hold on to fragments and threads yeah. of nature, nature reserves, really. And, sure. we, and then we put a fence around them. You know, not necessarily a physical fence, but no. so. For, for a lot of people, in order to get some nature, they get in their car and they drive to a nature reserve yeah. and then they come out of that nature reserve and go back to, you know, civilization. Yeah. So I think we, we've got to get around. We've got to understand that, that our, our country is, is massively depleted. Mm -hmm. That's the starting point yeah. and understanding and recognizing that. From there, okay, that's the situation we're in. Mm -hmm. What can we do? What what yeah. can we do to, to to improve things? And rewilding is the is the sort of buzzword around the conservation industry yeah. at the moment. It's all about ecological restoration, landscape scale, habitat change, thinking like a mountain, thinking yep. about the bigger picture, thinking how everything works. And this is not only a you know, this is not some sort of romantic notion of, of, of going back to some sort of Garden of Eden. This is yeah. this is a pragmatic movement because, you know, we're seeing floods at the yeah. moment, obviously the big the big uh, looming clouds of climate change, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So actually, you know, I think you, you don't actually have to give a hoot about pine trees or pine martins because yes. this stuff affects us all. Yeah. A healthy environment means a healthy human society. And I think, you know, we've got to start moving away from this this perception that that everything is is good, yep. everything is fine, it isn't, and we've got to start moving along that journey to a wilder, um, a wider environment that allows natural processes to govern our landscape and yep. not only to serve nature but to serve us too. Yeah, yeah. And so, as more we we are now becoming more inclusive with the environment as well, because it's coming closer to us. Yeah. I, well, I think we you know we have as as we yeah. become more and more urbanized as a, as a society, as a species, we yeah. are becoming detached from where we came from and, yeah. and you know we 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 perceive that to be an a, a, a progression and in some ways it is we all live very comfortable insulated lives sure 
but um, equally, you know, we th that detachment is now leading to to both physical and and in some cases um, mental conditions that are that are starting to prevail across wider society. So yeah, you know, I think I think the, our relationship with nature has become fractured. Yes, or broken. Some yeah. might argue. And I think it's in our own interest, whether you give a hoot about wildlife or not, it's in our own interest to start yeah. to stop um, repairing that. We've now got the the beaver is now mm. back. Yeah, but I was reading that uh, up until it came back, obviously just recently, it was about four hundred years yeah. it's been gone for. Yeah. So, as you say, depletion from what I'm seeing is not something that just started to happen in the nineteen twenties. Oh or no, something. no, 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 no. It's it's we seem to have devastated it long before that. I mean, we'll be talking about mm. wolves hopefully mm. in a wee while, mm. but uh, I think the last they say the last wolf was like sixteen eighty eight mm. or something. It mm. was killed. Mm. Uh, yeah, and there's been peaks and troughs along that journey. Um, you know, if you go back to to early settlements, I, again, I don't want to come over as as, as conjuring up some sort of romantic notion no, no, that, know. that you know the neolithic man lives some sort of harmonious existence yes. with, with wildlife of course that was not the case but as as i mean farming was a big turning point yeah you know, when we started to settle down and moved away yeah. from becoming hunter gatherers nomadic hunter gatherers that was a turning point because yeah. of course stock was was then in situ wild mm -hmm. animals were in, uh, uh, predating on that stock so i think you know the 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 battle with nature so to speak set in many many hundreds of years yeah. ago and it's accelerated and decelerated ever since so some of the peaks have been two world wars when yeah. you know deforestation was was rife because we yeah. needed timber for the war effort that made a massive difference yeah. to, to to the habitats and of course the animals that live there um persecution has been rife historically yeah. um thing i mean again you know we we used to have lynx wolves and bears yeah. in this country we used to have wild boar and oryx mm -hmm. and, and elk and all of these animals these have all been eliminated way before our existence yeah. of course. so we have no memory of them we have yes. no connection with them which yeah. again is a is a factor uh, beavers more recently as you as you say so there's been a, a history of us manipulating the environment to our own ends yes now you know some would argue that's just natural evolution and and that you know i get that argument i would argue that that depletion if it doesn't cost me in my lifetime will ultimately catch up with us and cost yeah. somebody in the future we're already seeing um illustrations manifestations of that with with climate change with flooding Plus, with with um you know air quality things yep. like this so this is not a this is not just a conversation for you know left-wing liberal vegan no, bunny not. huggers yeah, this is exactly. a conversation for society at, at large yeah. so uh, yeah we've we've done a lot of made a lot of changes and i think in scotland it, it's it's more difficult to perceive because there are still huge areas of of yeah. wild land, twenty five percent of Scotland's land area is, mm -hmm. is dedicated to either open hill deer stalking or driven grouse shooting. Yes, now, I'm not, you know, I'm not condemning those those pursuits, no. but we've got to ask ourselves, you know, that's a huge amount of land dedicated to a yes. very specific interest group and a relatively mm -hmm. small number of people. Is that the best we can do with that landscape? What would you do if they say that got reduced? Then I, I think. Yeah, I'm I, talking I, you in a hypothetical here. <laughs> I know. I but mean, hypothetically, if I mean, if you walked away from a from a, a grouse moor in in the East Grampians, for example, and did nothing, yeah, and and you know, there's a there's a story behind the the perception that we need to do something. You know, we've got right. this obsession that the land needs managing, that nature yeah. can't possibly survive without yeah. without our help, our intervention. So so you know, in answer to your question, I might argue do nothing let yeah. it let nature take its course right. and what would what would probably happen in some of the areas of the east grampians is that you know there's a dormant seed source in the soil over a period of time yeah. and we're talking decades you know the forest that that, that once existed there mm -hmm. birch rowan aspen hazel pine oak etc would gradually regenerate and of course on the back of that the animals that are associated with that would, would, return. would, would return so yeah. there is an argument i mean rewilding really as much as anything is about is about taking a step back and letting mm -hmm. nature do what it needs to do right. and that applies not only to to things like grouse moors but you know if you look at our rivers almost all of them have been straightened or channelized or or you know embanked or dredged or one yeah. way or the other we we've had a go at manipulating them to our own ends and you know again you could argue with the recent flooding we're now seeing the the results yeah, of that i follow this gentleman online and what a lot of what you're saying there about 
just leave it to mm. do what it's going to do. He runs a, a small uh, farm in San Francisco in mm. America. He decided what he wanted to do. He's not going to till the ground. Uh, he said, I'm not tilling the ground because that's just ruining soil. And he mm. had a very different yeah. way he approached it. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of his was, I'm going to plant what should be here. And then smaller vegetation areas and bigger hedgerows. Yeah. And what he found was the hedgerows are now full of birds, yeah. uh, full of insects, full of uh, the right type of snakes, as yeah. he says. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's now got this very much this harmonious living. And he's producing, you know, something like, I think he said something like 30% more yeah. food than somebody that does on the same amount of land. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's able to replant quicker because his soil... Um, what he calls the organic matter, yeah, as you sure, would know. Sure, sure. Um, I believe, from what he said, the average American farm, uh, this is what he's saying anyway, uh, the organic mar- uh, matter in the soil when they test it is between 1% and 2%. Yeah. His is getting tested, and it's between 15 and 20%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so by, like you said, just letting nature take care of it, mm. and he's obviously saying, well, I could get involved in planting my stuff, but as long as I keep nature here as yeah, well sure and he's completely organic yeah. and what and what he found was is that he doesn't have huge pesticide issues mm. he doesn't have to use sprays mm. he doesn't have tons of uh insects coming and eating all his i mean he obviously will have some sure. uh but because of the hedgerows because he's got the right things the right insects are mm. there the mm. ladybugs are mm. coming in they're mm. eating all the right stuff mm. And he's able to make it happen. Yeah. yeah, and there are examples of exactly what you've just described in the in the UK now. And I think there's a growing realization. I mean, there's a, you know, it, it sounds like we're having a go at farmers, and we're not because no. they they operate within a system that yes. society created. I mean, the you know the, the common agricultural policy, which which feeds subsidy, well, did until we left Europe. Yeah, fed subsidy into the farming system that was created after the, after the last World War when when mm-hmm. we were starving. We yes. needed farmers to produce food yeah. but you know we're 70 years on now and our challenges are very different to what they yeah. were then so and and really the farming system hasn't really yeah. adapted in recognition of, of that so farmers find themselves in a system at the moment we're asking them to produce not only to produce food but to produce cheap food yes because we've become accustomed to not spending very much money on exactly our food. yeah um and and so they find themselves in this system whereby on the one hand, they're being asked to be optimally productive. Yeah. But on the other hand, they're being criticised for for wiping out hedgerows and biodiversity and all the yes. rest of it. So some farmers quite legitimately, I would say, feel they're on a bit of a hiding to nothing. So yeah. the, at a societal level, we have to understand the principles yeah. that you've just described and start changing the system yeah. so that we can allow farmers to produce food. We all need to eat, of course, yeah. but to do it in a way that benefits not only a greater yeah. uh, number of species, but greater number of, yeah. of, 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 you know, a greater breadth of society. So, um, yeah, I mean, so these are some of the fundamental challenges that, that rewilding hopes to address. It's not a silver bullet for everything, no. but it's a it's part of a process of moving from a very extractive, exploitative regime yeah. that we've had for 78 years into much more of a, of a co-creation, a, a, a reinvestment. A revitalization yeah. Yeah. Is, is a good word. And rewilding is, is part of that process. I think we have become, slowly over the years, we, we get become more and more disconnected. Yeah. Um, and I think that I, I actually uh, read a book uh, a few years ago. It was actually, I don't know if you remember, the there was a TV show called Rin Tin Tin. Um, yeah. and the book was actually all about him but before they went into that story the woman done a, a whole sort of history on dogs and uh, she, she had this very interesting chapter about um, uh, people as people progressed uh, you got lawyers you got accountants you got carpenters and so they, they weren't necessarily farming anymore mm. so they were you know well i'm doing the carpentry work so i'll go to the market to buy the vegetables yeah, from yeah, the car yeah. and so they slowly disconnected away from yeah, farms yeah. Uh, and w- what she was talking about was this disconnect from wildlife sure what she said was there was this uh in the sort of late 40s 50s area there was this boom in the, uh, I, I guess it would be that American middle class mm-hmm. just after the war, mm-hmm. and people started getting dogs. Yeah. 
and dogs became really popular. Yeah, yeah, it was, you know, yeah. and that sort of saying, yeah. you know, husband, wife, two kids, and yeah, the dog yeah, sort of yeah. thing came about. Yeah. And it was based on people were then going out and getting a dog. They they had this reminiscence, maybe like you said, this mm. romantic thing mm. of, yeah, my granddad or who my dad spoke about being on the farm and they had the dog, mm. and so suddenly they're like, well, we should get a dog. Mm. There is this disconnect um, where people are now living in, you know, a one-bedroom flat. Yeah. They don't have any animals. And occasionally, you know, they'll have a hamster, a goldfish, mm. that type mm. of thing. Mm. But the, this disconnect has got... F- and we're, I, I believe as well we're further away from our food chain. Yeah. Half the people don't know where their food comes from. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know there was a documentary a few years ago about battery hens. Mm. Uh, and probably similar to what you're doing using visual story they'd done the documentary and there was this mind there was a mindset mm. and I, I, I think it was some like 70 percent of eggs changed from being battery hen eggs to being and i use the term loosely more to barn raised than yeah, sure. uh organic raised mm. i i know that the term organic could be loosely mm. used now mm. but there was a change because people saw it yeah uh, yeah. And I, I like what you're doing with that. You're trying to, as you said, try to use visual storytelling to hopefully people go, I had no idea about that. Well, that's that's the holy grail, to be honest. If if people go away from you know reading one of our books or coming to yep. one of our presentations or, or see listen one of to my uh, podcast or listen to <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, if people go away, I didn't realize that or I had no idea yeah. that dot dot dot. Yeah. Then then our job is done, really. So we're not here to tell people what to think or to no. instruct them how to to feel, even if that was possible. What we're really doing is trying to give them the tools, give them some information with yeah. which to draw their own conclusions. And interesting, you should say about the the children. There's a, a an American author called Richard Louvre who wrote a book not long ago, actually called Last Child in the Woods, and and it was really all about this disconnection that you referred mm-hmm. to. And 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 he ended up calling this condition, as it were, nature deficit disorder. Yeah. And there's been quite a lot of research initially in the states, but more in in the UK now, that literally does. Uh, create this this connection between a detachment from nature yeah and and in many ways that that needs to be kind of contextualized because that doesn't mean taking driving children to a to a beach and giving them an hour and then driving them back that's yeah. about you know letting kids out the next uh, out the door and, and yeah. cr- carry on you know doing creative play like when i was a kid you just used to walk into the woods and you know you were in the yeah. burns and you were making dams tree houses whatever but the the point being really is that this nature deficit disorder is leading to really quite severe societal issues. So yep. you know, uh, attention deficit, depression, all of these things that are that are, are now quite commonplace in in a younger generation. Yeah, I'm not saying they're all down to to a detachment from nature, but there is a growing body of science that links those two elements. Yeah, and and as you say, most children these days, rightly or wrongly, spend. Well, they certainly spend more time indoors than they ever have done. Yeah. Um, there's all the perceptions of of stranger danger, of traffic, of yep. all the you know all of these sorts of things. Yeah. But actually, cosseting children in that sort of artificial environment in the long term, yeah. And science is now backing this up. This yeah. is not anecdotal. Um, is is detrimental to their development. So yeah, as a society, we need to be mindful of all of these looming issues. Yeah. No, definitely. I I my sister's got two kids, and uh, I've spoken to her before, and I, I would say to her. Do you remember when we were kids, we would, and I know it sounds, it sounds old. And I terrible, know, that's the trouble, yeah, old yeah, days, yeah, yeah, I know. You know, I mean, I'm 43, but uh, I remember getting on our bikes, and where we lived, it was only really, uh, you know, ha- not even less than half a dozen houses, mm. and we were into the countryside, yeah, yeah, but yeah. we used to just jump on our bikes, and that would be from maybe the age of six or seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I remember yeah. saying to my sister, would you let, Miley and Oakley go do that mm. now, and she said, "Not mm. a chance." But statistically, she's totally wrong. She's totally wrong. Exactly. They're just as safe, if not safer. So yeah. it's all down to perceptions, and again, it's yeah. all down to that alienation, that disconnection, mm-hmm. and then even you know, it, you, you alluded to it there. It, 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 we've got this this societal mindset whereby there has to be an urban environment and yeah. then the countryside. They're two separate things. Yeah. And, and again, I think, you know, if we get a lot, we've got to get more creative and more imaginative about yeah. how we design our, mm-hmm. our living spaces. There's no yeah. there's no rule that says you can't have, you know, flower-rich meadows in the middle of housing estates or, yeah. or, or play parks or, or whatever. Um, just to integrate, to blur those lines, really, yeah. between the countryside and 
our space. Of course, you know? yeah. And I think, you know, again, it's not a... It's not some fluffy bunny hugging sort no. of notion of an environmentalist. It's just common sense at a societal yeah. level to try and address some of these social issues. These are not yeah. environmental issues. These are social issues. Yeah. And I think increasingly, you know, environmental challenges and social challenges are starting to become one and the same. Yeah. No, definitely. I agree with that. I'd, like I said, I said that to my sister as well. I said, mm. statistically, you're not any worse no. off letting your kids go out and no. do stuff. Um, and she goes, yeah, but I know in her head. In her head, yeah, she's yeah. not getting you know she's not getting away from that. And I said to her, I says it's. I mean, when we were, I said when we were growing up, uh, there was a spat of dogs seem to be killing people yeah, or yeah. you know shaking babies yeah, or whatever it is. Yeah. And I says, when was the last time you heard about a dog attack? Mm, mm. And she was like, oh, never. I says, do you think dogs have suddenly went? Uh, the journalists are on us. We better stop biting people. <laughs> you know, that's just not true. No. They just start reporting on exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. You know, because yeah. people, at some point, people just go, oh, I'm tired of hearing about a dog. Yeah. You know, it's a terrible thing, but people go, oh, that's another bit. Oh, you know, and they just sort of... They just switch off. They switch yeah, off, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's too much, yeah. you know. I mean, um, the media, the, sorry to interrupt, the, the media, no, I think, has a, has a, I mean, has a responsibility. I think we all recognise that, but it actually has a has an opportunity. I mean, it's a very, very powerful thing, the media. It, yes. It literally tells us what to think, and, and we follow yeah. suit, wittingly or otherwise. Yeah. Um, and so you're right, you know, for a period, every dog is a dangerous dog, every every man standing on the corner of the street is a, yeah. a paedophile or whatever. Yes. Um, and, and the media report that and, and spread, you know, all the anxiety that, that you alluded to. Yeah. There are some serious issues out there, there's, there's no question. But again, statistically, logically, rationally, children are just as safe today as they yeah, were 50 years ago. If not more. If not more so. So, yeah. you know, I think the media have a... I mean, whether we, we ask this of the media and they deliver it or whether they lead us on it, but, but you know, there's, yeah. there's, this, there's this tendency towards sensationalism, yeah. crisis, trauma, yeah. drama, and we, and we soak it up. I had mentioned before, I'd lived in America for mm. about six years. Mm. We lived up in the, the Uinta Mountains, which is just behind mm. the Rockies. Mm. And so I got, I mean, I've always been interested in nature and things like that, but that was when I really got interested because mm. we had come outside to go to my car and I'm looking going, that's a pretty big footprint. Mm. Where's, what is that? Mm. Take a picture of it, show it to them. They're like, yeah, it's a cougar. Mm. You've got a cougar mm. coming through. Mm. And uh, friends that lived in the same area, they had cameras up and they yeah. would capture cougars walking mm. through. And what we found was there was a, there was a lake that was up behind where we were and the river ran about, Maybe about 50 feet from our house and the cougars were coming up at the back to go to the sure. there but uh we had i had two big dogs i took across there with me uh two alaskan malamutes right and so i, I think that kept anything because most wild animals they don't want to interfere no, no, with us no, that much no, or anything no. uh, and we had moose yeah coming through and big moose would just wander through brilliant and, you know it was fantastic yeah, i absolutely yeah, loved it yeah, yeah. um so it was a great place to get involved because you know they've got so much land again they're probably having the same issues that we're they having. They are having the same um, issues. But but I think, you know, a, a visit, well, I say a visit, in your case, you live there, but, a, 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 you know, absorbing those sorts of wild landscapes and all the, all yeah. the wild, it, it gives you a, a fresh perspective. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, with the best will in the world, it makes you come back to, to Britain and, and Scotland, even Scotland, yeah. even the Highlands, thinking this is nowhere near what I perceived it to be, you yeah. know, and it's only when you see what it could be like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're right in America, they've got, they've got challenges of their own. Um, and you know, that the fact that they do coexist with all these large dangerous animals, yeah. um, that it, it does, it gives you a fresh perspective for sure. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. the, there was, there was some sightings when I was there, they said they had some sightings, whether it was not, it was up in uh, what they call Logan, Utah, which was just the very much North, part of utah and they said they had seen some sightings of wolves mm, mm. moving in from there because they've got them in idaho yeah um and they, so they said that they were some of them were moving in mm, up there mm. uh but what they did have um up there was uh they had those uh it's not a sheep dog but they had particular dogs that lived with the sheep yeah yeah um, i mean that's quite common now in, in <coughs> excuse me in europe so these livestock yeah, guarding dogs that, right. are, that are specifically bred to be um you know, to be aggressive towards wolves, but but not but to people, and, and obviously and not to sheep, to sheep either. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, in, in parts of a lot, many parts of Europe, and, and places where there are still 
quite heavy populations of yeah. large carnivores like Romania, for example, these these livestock guarding mm-hmm. dogs are, are pretty common. I think, you know, that experience that, that you've obviously had is a, is a massive education, a huge education. Yeah. And, and it's an education that, you know, most kids here don't mm-hmm. uh, don't uh, don't have access to. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there are, there are some really great initiatives, things like the forest school movement. Yeah. It, the, you know, there is a recognition of the, of the situation we're in. There is a gentleman. Uh, that I read about as well. Now, I, is it Lister? He owns an estate up in Scotland, and yeah. he's wanting to bring wolves and put them in a more a fenced off, like twenty acre thing. What What is that about? Is that something? Paul Lister is the guy you're referring to. He's right. the uh, he's the son of the guy that had MFI. You know, the big furniture chain. Right. Okay. So he's yeah. the heir to the MFI fortune. He bought Allerdale Estate, which is up in Sutherland, right, uh, in two thousand and three. And I suppose um, he he did two things, one good, one bad. He he brought the rewilding conversation. It wasn't called rewilding then, but he brought the conversation around ecological restoration yep. to the mainstream. It was mm-hmm. no longer as taboo as it was sure. previously. The flip side of that, because of his, um, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, because of his obsession with this, what he wanted to create and still does is is an as, as an African style wilderness reserve, fenced wilderness reserve. Right. Okay. So, with all the relevant components within it, bears, wolves, lynx, uh, predator prey interactions, yeah. etc. So, to all intents and purposes, a natural ecosystem, right? Albeit contained. Contained. Yeah. When I say contained, he owns um, twenty three thousand acres on Allerdale. Wow. But he also, well, you say wow, but uh, actually, when you're talking about a functioning ecosystem, it's yeah. a relatively small, small area of yeah. land. So his problem has, has always been um, problems. He needed more land. His neighbours right. are all traditional deer stalking estates, right. and he's never quite managed to persuade them of the economic model as sure. well as the ecological right. model. So his argument was always be, we'll create this attraction and just like Kruger or, or lots of other yep. African style, you know, they will They'll create come. visitors. They will come. And, yeah. and you know, I, I have no doubt that yeah. the, the socioeconomic models that he Field built... Field of dreams. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So the, the two obstacles have always been, A, the... Uh, unwillingness of neighbouring landowners to join in. They they drew this map around about 70,000 acres and said, if we can secure that, then we can make it happen. But of course, the big, big, big obstacle, physical and, and philosophical, was the fence. Right. So, you know, Scotland, as you know, fought long and hard to establish the access legislation mm-hmm. whereby everybody has the right to roam. And here's a, what was perceived as a wealthy English landowner coming in yes. and, and, and basically sectioning off a huge chunk of the highlands. So that flew in the face of obviously that 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 um the hikers, the that, ramblers. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. the ramblers were one of the most vocal detractors. Although ironically the Ram, Ram, Ramblers Association in Scotland at least is in favour of of species reintroductions and rewilding sure. generally, just not within a fenced reserve. Right. So Paul was one of the early pioneers in Scotland of yes. the philosophy that is now called rewilding. Right. Um but of course with that came the the tag Wolfman of the Highlands. Right. Yeah. And for all the reasons you mentioned earlier on about media headlines and sensation sensationalism yeah although he's done a huge amount of ecological restoration work he's done a huge amount with local kids getting them out there doing all the stuff that we've just talked about he's still the guy that wants wolves back and yeah. that's the headline that sticks right. uh, and all of the baggage that goes with that so that's yeah. that's how that story started right okay and so how did you get involved i mean i know you're involved obviously with rewilding it's bringing in animals what animals would you say are on your list to bring back besides wolves is there any other animals you want to bring back to scotland or which ones are missing <sighs> okay well ju- just can i sidestep that yeah, a little sure, bit just yeah, just sure. for a minute because i think again we we, we tend to get obsessed with individual animals and, and yes, wolves are an obvious one because they're they're charismatic they're yes. contentious they're, they're all the things that wolves are and and we focus on them, right? And we, and we tend to focus on on predators because they 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 carry baggage with them. They yeah. some people love them, some people hate them. There's a whole range of of emotional and cultural and political baggi- yeah. baggage around predators. Mm-hmm. And at the very very top of that tree, of course, is the wolf. So that's the headline grabber, right? For me personally, uh-huh. a wolf is no more important than a red squirrel or a wood yeah. ant or a, a piece of bacteria. Well, it, it's a component at. in the system. Yeah. So if you look at nature, 
as a as an e- an engine, an yep. ecological engine. What we have at the moment is an engine with lots of its parts missing. Right. Not so many that the engine has ground to a halt. Yeah. But the engine is certainly spluttering. Right. And has been for many years, and will continue to get worse and worse yeah. and worse as biodiversity and species mm-hmm. are, are lost. So for me, it's not about singling out a big charismatic carnivore like wolves and saying we need them back. We do. Yeah. But only because. They're part of the engine. Right. So you could argue that, you know, an extinct butterfly equally is part of that engine. Of course. That that our insect populations and the fact that they've been decimated over recent decades are part of that engine. Mm -hmm. And arguably, in the case of insects, far more important, important in inverted commas, than than wolves. So wolves get the headlines in terms of species reintroductions. But they are just one animal in a much broader suite of species that arguably should and, and could be brought back right but going back to your question about the list so on, on the on the predator list you've got things like wolf obviously mm-hmm. bear you've got lynx yep. which is a much more palatable and easily yeah um introduced species than wolves so so if you were asking me at a pragmatic level yeah i would say forget wolves wolves is like if, again drawing an analogy with a cake sure. if you think about if you think about baking a cake Wolves are really the the you know the 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 fairy on the cherry on the top of the cake. It's yeah. the final piece in the jigsaw. We've not actually been out to the shops to buy the ingredients for the cake yet. Yeah, We're not yeah. sort of baking it. Yeah. So there's a huge amount of habitat restoration work and species restoration work to do before we even start having a conversation about wolves. Beavers, case in point, as you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. But if we're talking about large carnivores, then lynx is a much more palatable. Um, and 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 less sensitive species to bring yes. back because they don't have the emotional and physical baggage that wolves bring with them. Right. So lynx would be a, an obvious candidate to answer your question. Okay. And the the is it a particular lynx that is it the euro is it the lynx that are in europe but what, what kind of lynx would it, you would yeah. like to introduce <clears throat> well the the native species the lynx that used yeah. to live here is the eurasian lynx Eurasian-y. which have a have yeah. a spread across uh, most of northern europe mm-hmm. and down into asia there is a there is a separate population a, a separate species in in uh, spain and portugal called the iberian lynx but okay. the lynx that we would be talking about that now live in france in italy in spain in germany etc cetera, etc cetera, would be the eurasian lynx eurasian yeah yeah very cool and I presume, uh, I mean, obviously up until Brexit, we were part of Europe. Mm. <laughs> and I, I looked I looked online, I saw, like you said, they're in Italy, they're mm. moving in Germany, uh, Romania is yep. full of, yep. uh, uh, I, there's a documentary, it's on Netflix. Yes, about, that's right, Wild Card um, Paper. That was, um, you mentioned Paul Lister, that was sponsored by, by he, he paid oh, was for it? Yeah, Wild Card Excellent. Paper. Excellent, yeah. yeah I have, I've got it on my list, It's I've got I've got so many of them, they're, they're that blue planet and all the bits and yeah. pieces. I've went through, I'm doing little episodes every so often. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was astonished with how much Romania mm. has. Mm. Um, why is it that we, as again, we're part of Europe uh, before Brexit, mm. of course. Why is it we have not taken up what the Europe, it seems like Europe has allowed mm. to happen? Mm. Not saying it's happened overnight there. No, I'm no. sure they've had their challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, whew, that's a big question. Um, I mean, fundamentally, it, it is the fact that we refuse to live with these animals. It, right. We, it's not that we can't. Yeah. It, there's plenty of food, there's plenty of habitat. Yeah. It, it's that we won't. It's as simple as that. So, you know, part of my job in many ways is nurturing tolerance from intolerance. We have become an intolerant species or an intolerant society, should I say, within the UK. I think there are other issues. So most of the um, the the expanding population of, let's say, lynx, wolf and bear, for the sake of argument, in in Europe is, is as a result of recolonization in other mm-hmm. words these animals are spreading from places like romania poland where they've never been extinct yeah. and because of changing attitudes and legislation across europe different hunting legislation now persecution is much less enlightened yeah. attitudes amongst the public these animals are finding their way back yeah. to places where they've not been seen in, in generations so mm-hmm. there's a there's a there's a natural spread yes. across mainland europe now of course in our case there's a problem because there's 22 miles of water between yeah. us and, and mainland Europe, which again, if you think about it logically, is just a, 
you know, it's a phys- It's almost like just having a big, it's, it's like having Loch Ness spreading yeah. across twenty two. Yeah. So it, but but psychologically that makes us not it, physically it makes us an island, but yeah. psychologically it makes us an island as well. Yeah. So one of the reasons that we haven't got them is that we would physically have to reintroduce them. We would have yeah. to pick them up and bring them here. Yeah. And that's a that's a physical obstacle obstacle, but it's also a philosophical obstacle. Yeah. But. In reality, the fundamental reason that we don't have large carnivores here is that because we, the, the citizens of the, of the UK, refuse to have them here or are right. not willing to have them here. And we've forgotten how to live with them. You know, if you think yeah. about Romania, they've got challenges, but they've adapted mm-hmm. to having these animals around because yeah. they've, they've never not had them around. Mm-hmm. We've had, you know, for generations, we've forgotten how to live with them. So there's a massive yeah um, cultural gap there's a there's a, 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 a as i say a philosophical and emotional gap yeah what i find bizarre really about this situation is that i, I can't imagine i mean i I'm, I'm happy to be wrong but i can't sure. imagine that anybody who opposes the presence of large carnivores in britain would advocate their extinction across their range i can't imagine anybody saying mm-hmm. no i don't want wolves here yeah, and then saying, and I don't actually want wolves anywhere in the world either. Yeah, but that's completely irrational because you're basically saying, I don't want them here, but I want France, Italy, Germany, Canada, yeah. US, whatever, to live with them. I don't want. I expect you people, yeah, to look after these animals. Mm-hmm. I want to know they exist in the, on the planet. Yeah, I just don't want them on my back doorstep. Yeah. So I would argue that if you if you don't want links, for example, here in the UK then rationally logically by extension by extinct extension yeah you don't want them anywhere in the world yeah and i don't think most people would advocate that yeah so we have this bizarre illogical irrational yeah relationship with these animals um and yeah. and, and, and and you know to bring them back we know how to do it physically yeah, yeah. It, it, you know there's been reintroductions all all the way around the world this is a people thing. This is yeah. not about wolves or lynx or bears. Mm-hmm. This is about people and their and their deep seated values and cultural belief systems. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, part of my job is that I hesitate to use the word education because it sounds very patronizing, but it's no. it's this acclimatization. What are the opportunities offered by these animals as well as the the problem or the obstacles yeah. that, 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 that they will inevitably bring with them? Of and it's a question of being honest and transparent and and receptive to listen to other people's points of view but when you look at it fundamentally it makes no sense for us to advocate these animals existing elsewhere Mm -hmm. and not to have them here yeah no that makes perfect sense uh i had uh, i had a conversation a friend of mine who does a lot of hill hill climbing munros all that type of thing spends a lot of time out doing that and uh again uh, he may listen to this. I, I, he's my uncle, but <laughs> he, are you listening, uncle? He, you're listening. Hopefully, <laughs> but uh, I, again, as much as someone who I think, yeah, he's he's out there doing Munros. He's he's out there, and maybe it's the, but there you could still probably be doing that and still have a disconnect of he's just going. I'm doing this Munro. Yeah, it's about yeah. you know, like you said, you're just trophy hunting yeah, that, yeah. and but he's not getting. Maybe he's not quite grasping. The big, like you said, do sure. the mountain big picture. Sure. He's just like, oh, I've went over the mountain, I've went over this one, yeah. that's it, and I'm yeah, down yeah. the hill and I'm yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, like you said, you drive out, you do that, and then you leave. Um, and I think that because I, I said I said to him, I've got this gentleman, he's coming in, um, and one of the things again, it's the highlight is he he would love to introduce wolves mm. or bears mm. or things mm. like that. Mm. It's part of the conservation, and he's like, oh, right away mm. it was. Uh, I'm not too sure, you know, sprained ankle, something goes wrong, you're stuck on the side yeah, of a one row, yeah, yeah. and there's wolves out there. Yeah. And that was his first reaction. Well, I think, you know, we've been we've been brought up. That's the yeah. culture. We've been brought up to believe that, uh, you know, there's, there's a guy in, in in America to believe they're dangerous is what I was going to say. Of and, course, and, yeah. and they're not, you know, statistically, they're, they're, they're just not. Um, so, I mean, there are problems that come with wolves. Of there's course. no doubt about yeah. that, but... but People's safety is is not one of them, and certainly not with links. Um, th- I think there are, you know, there's, there's this guy in America who, who's who's an expert on wolves, and he says that people don't love wolves, and equally, people don't hate wolves. They love or hate what they stand for. So, if, if yeah. you know, I, I listen to wolf advocates that 
that have this notion of, of of wolves somehow being symbolic of a wilderness once lost. It's back to that Garden of Eden yes. notion, really. But equally, I hear people that are, that are opposed to wolves that that come out with such nonsense, really, in in the year twenty twenty. Yes. Really. Hopefully, we've got past Little Red Riding Hood, haven't we? Really? Yeah, no. But actually, deep seated in yeah. there is these cultural lessons that we were taught as kids yeah. that wolves are are dangerous. Yeah. They're not. That that's it. I'm not holding yeah. wolves up as some sort of um, you know, angelic creature. That they, yeah. they come with challenges, there's no doubt about that. But human safety is is not one of them. Yeah. I mean I had uh, a similar thing uh, again living out in Utah and uh, some friends from Scotland and, and uh, I had said to them, Oh yeah, that's a, a cougar trap. Yeah, straight back indoors. And they were <laughs> like, What? you know, and uh, and then there were even just things like uh when we initially went to the cabin, uh it was a Oh, I say it was a log based on the outside, yeah. but you plasterboard with the inside, mm. and you obviously made it much more warm and comfortable than a regular sort of log cabin. It wasn't just a hut, mm. if you know what I mean. Mm. Um, but it needed work done. My dad bought it as a fixer upper. My dad, besides being a lawyer, was a builder as well, and he, this was his sort of retirement dream: yeah, yeah. buy this cabin, build it from the you know inside out. And when we f- when we got there, it discovered that there was a black bear mm. just starting to try and hibernate right. in the basement. Okay, okay. Um, and right away, my mum's like, "We're leaving. <laughs> We're not living here." <laughs> you know, uh, my dad's got his cowboy hat on. You know, he thinks this is awesome. Yeah. You know, and uh, the first thing we done is we just called the local sheriff, mm. and he showed up. And I thought, I guess he's going to go and shoot it. Mm. You know, like mm. what do you do? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, he just he went into that basement with a big pots and pans and just banged it off. Yeah, yeah. And the bear took off. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think when he had one of his deputies there, and as it ran away, the deputy shot it with a rubber bullet, sure. hit it in the bum. Yeah. Um, uh, and it just it just took off. Yeah. And he says the chances that'll no come back. Yeah, don't come back because it had that little shot from yeah. the bullet. The yeah. noise it's, it yeah. doesn't want anything to do with it. No. no. Uh, and that was kind of like our first introduction to mm. living there, especially for my mum. She was panicking, thinking Brilliant. there was going to be bears coming in the house. Uh, again, for weeks after that, she would not go out to the car no, at no, night, no, you know. No. Uh, and occasionally we would play some pranks on me and my brothers. If she went out there, we would throw something out the window <laughs> and it would make a noise and she was panicking, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know. But, uh, yeah, I think it's... For some reason, I guess maybe maybe it's in our DNA or something mm. from that predator. We're not. We're all. I mean, again, we're here. And we, for sixteen eighty eight is when the wolf was possibly killed. Yeah, we're now the predator. Yeah, exactly. And we're like, well, wait a minute. I don't want something that might be able to take me down out there. Yeah. Uh, again, my uncle was one right away. Mm. Well, I do this Monroe hike, and mm. how would that affect me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that's, you know, that's that's a question that everybody has to ask themselves. How, yeah. how do all of these changes affect you at a personal level? I mean, I would argue that your uncle's experience of climbing Scotland's Monroes would be massively enriched by walking up through some lovely native mm-hmm. woodland um, into the sort of montane zone with birch and willow scrub with lots of more birds and, and yeah. animals about. And and that, that in my opinion, that, that tantalising prospect or, 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 or at worst that sort of tingling prospect, yeah. if you like, of, of potentially running into a, a large wild animal. Mm-hmm. The fact is we're not used to it. You know, we've no. grown up not yeah. having to think about that, not having to adapt to it. So it's uncomfortable for us. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it, it's... I would argue, <laughs> simply because, you know, I've, I've been to some of these places, uh, you know, I'd much rather sleep in, uh, on the veranda of your cabin in Utah yeah. with bears, with snakes, with wolves, with mountain lions, yeah. whatever, than walk through Dundee on a Saturday night. Yeah, no, no disrespect to Dundee. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you know, so it's, I know it's, exactly again, it's it, you know, a little bit of... Ex- and I, I would imagine when you came away from Utah, you, you know, you're probably looking back at that thing, oh, what were we worried about? It wasn't, there's no big yeah, deal. But at the, time, at the time, in your mind, it's a big issue. Yeah. yeah so again, was. I think, you know, this is, this is a, this is a social, psychological, emotional process yeah. that, that if we want these animals back, we're going to have to go through yeah. it and learn to live with yeah. them again. That's the thing. I told, I, I said that to my uncle as well. I said, look, I, I had friends and they had pictures on their wall where they were obviously backpacking. They came round the corner and here's this black bear just yeah. standing there. Yeah. Yeah. And they're they're like this now. The bear's further enough back, and they're like this around the corner, and they're getting a picture taken. Mm, mm. And then basically they just made some noise, mm. and it ran off. Yeah, yeah. Now, 
cl- uh, my uncle initially was like, well, I mean, they probably have a gun or something because in America they have a mm. gun. I says, yeah, mm. but Europea- Europe has quite mm. strict gun laws mm. and Romania and all yeah, these things. Yeah. They're th- still, they're able to cohabitate sure, there. Sure. Now, I have read online, there has been people that have been attacked by different animals. Uh, Alaska uh, being one of them. There was a, and, and some people have been killed. But it's over the that sort of you know spread of decades mm, and mm, years. Mm, mm. It's just not that many. There's more people killed by cars and uh, and horses, falling trees, and horses, sheep, and cows. You yeah, know, we we don't we, or... yeah we don't bat an eyelid about living with big animals yeah. because they're domesticated and the like, and we yeah. always live with them. You know, a, a big animal is capable of doing you of harm, whether it's yeah. a wolf or a cow. But it, psychologically, you know, we've got into this this notion that a yeah. cow is safe, in inverted mm-hmm. commas, and a wolf isn't. So, yeah, yeah it, uh, statistically, it, it's irrational. But, but yes. somewhere, as you say, in our DNA, it, 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 a wolf in particular yes. is is um, is conjured up as a, as a wild animal. But if you're looking at, again, statistically, bears are much more, I won't say dangerous, but much more unpredictable yes. than wolves. Wol- wolves do not <coughs> pose a danger to, to humans. No. no. We, uh, there, when I was in Utah, I was, like I said, six years there, there was probably maybe, uh, the, the, at least the ones I read about in the newspaper or uh, that came on the news, I think there was maybe uh, two bear attacks. Yeah. And... I think one of them was fatal because it was a young child. Mm. But again, it was circumstances of uh, he was with his grandfather. They were camping. The kid had been eating candy that the granddad didn't know about. Mm. He'd Mm. left outside Mm. the tent. Mm. It was halfway in the tent. Mm. And the bear came trying to get the candy, got the kid. And obviously the kid starts screaming. The bear panics. Mm. And the it pulled the kid out mm. and kind of swung him because mm. it, it doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. And uh, the grandfather had to, you know, kind of chase it off. Uh, and uh, in fact, actually, no, the kid, w- he was seriously injured, but he didn't actually die. That's wrong. I shouldn't have said that. Um, I think there was the year before that it was an adult who was, uh, and he was an older gentleman. He was attacked. Uh, again, he wandered in on a mother sure. with the cubs. Yeah. And so these things happen but just not again, not on the scale that we seem to have in our heads. No, no. no uh, like my uncle, I've sprained my ankle. Oh no, that's it. I'm on the dinner yeah, plate yeah, now, you know. Yeah. It's just not, I have I just tell people, I'm like, it's not like that. It's just not like that. The story I always tell is that when, when we were doing the photo tours, we did a trip out to Alaska and, and it was grizzly mm-hmm. bears. It, you know, the, the trip name was Ultimate Grizzlies. Yeah. And it was six days photographing grizzly bears. Very, very close, one-to-one, no guns. Right. Pepper sure. spray and guide, fine, yeah. but... Um, and of course, what happened was everybody signed up, and then one by one, they all rang me up and said, "Oh, I've just given you three thousand quid. Are, are these bears safe?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, the camp record is such that blah blah blah, uh, but I I can't absolutely can't hand on heart it. guarantee it. You know, you pays your money, you takes your chance, yeah. kind of." But the irony of that is that the bears were perfectly safe. It, we actually, um, I say we, I wasn't involved with it, but half the group were involved in a plane crash. Oh, no. uh, nobody died, but Good. it was it was touch and go. But it was it was very traumatic. But the point being is that you know here we are worrying about uh, a close encounter with a bear. We're perfectly willing to jump inside a, a vacuum tin tube and yeah. fly at six hundred miles an hour, yeah. ten miles above the the earth. Yeah. Just because we're used to it and we're yeah. comfortable, but logically, if somebody does, if somebody suggested that you know five hundred years ago, yeah, I'll take the bear if you don't mind. I'll yeah. take my chances. You know what the hell is that all about? But yeah, exactly. Uh, so again, it's it's all about conditioning and, and what we're comfortable with mm-hmm. and what we what we're used to. So the the process of bringing any animal back, certainly yes. a large carnivore, it is apps. You know, ninety percent of it is a social people process it's right. not to do with the animal or how much there is to eat or where it can live it's all about people's levels of of tolerance and adaptability yeah. no definitely mm-hmm. definitely so again uh, you've said it's it's a big picture thing um but i am going to nail you down a little bit on the wolf thing because it's it's obviously an exciting thing mm-hmm. and uh, people i've spoken to have said oh i'd love to hear about yeah. how this would so how would you go about if you were obviously involved in it how would the process be of 
introducing the will. Okay. What would be the process? Well, there's a legal process. It's not just my, of, you know, not course, just yeah. my opinion. So, so there's a legal process laid down by the IUCN. <clears throat> um, there's a there's a thing called the Scottish Translocation Code, which is, um, which is a, again, it's a process laid down for species reintroductions across the board. That can mm -hmm. be plant species, it can be insect species, can be birds, or, or, or in this case, large mammals. So just to condense that down, there would have to be an extensive and inclusive consultation process right. with all potential stakeholders, by stakeholders, those people that are going to be impacted upon by, by this. And if we talk about large carnivores, that obviously includes people like farmers, yeah. gamekeepers, gillies, etc., etc. So... Again, that 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 may actually lead to a conclusion whereby, you know, Scotland just isn't ready for these yeah. animals. If we bring these animals back, they're not going to be accepted. They're going to be persecuted. Yeah. So therefore, the conditions that led to their extinction in the first place will happen again. still exist. Mm. So therefore, an application for reintroducing a license yeah. would be refused. Right. So that consultation process would have to be in depth, um, properly structured. Um, inclusive, yeah, uh, and 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 reach a conclusion that there was appetite, sufficient right. appetite for a reintroduction. If we got to that stage, then the biologists and the ecologists kick in, and you would then basically source a population of wolves on the continent. Yeah. The chances are you would bring them from an area where they were routinely eating red deer. Right. Because that's what you'd want them to eat in Scotland. Yeah, you wouldn't right. go to a pack that was routinely pinching a sheep flock. Yeah, no, no. That's just asking for trouble. Yeah. And the idea would be that those animals would continue to predominantly eat red deer. Yeah. Um, and what area of Europe uh, would 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 you choose? Well, have you had the choice? <sighs> It's likely to be somewhere like 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 Poland or or maybe uh, Eastern Germany or somewhere like right. that. Or, or maybe even uh, Scandinavia. Right. You know, Scandinavia in in Sweden in particular, not so much in Norway, but in Sweden in particular, they've got a a really healthy wolf population right. now. So it may be one of the Baltic countries, Eastern Europe or Scandinavia. But right. you know that that sort of genetic work yes. would be, would be done by somebody better qualified than I. And of and course. people like the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland who own, ed, own Edinburgh Zoo and Highland Wildlife Park, you know, their expertise in this, they were involved mm -hmm. with the beavers is is growing yes. uh, all the time. So we have the wherewithal, we have the expertise, we have the facilities to do it. Yes. The big big obstacle is the is the people thing. It's the getting, appetite. Is is the is getting over this this intolerance and turning it into tolerance that that's right. the, that's the switch that needs to be flipped mm -hmm. yeah and have you had opportunities to go and uh, view and photograph wolves uh, in any of these european countries or in america or that yourself yeah i mean really it was um i can remember this would be oh, i don't know 99 2000 um i was out in yellowstone where in 95 1995 fantastic they were in, park. yeah absolutely fun and that's you know where the wolves in idaho came that's from right. and now of course what you have what's seen in in seen in um in America, is it's not dissimilar to what's happening in Europe. Yeah. Wolves are now spreading up, up back across the lower forty-eight. Right. Um. You know they're now in Washington. Anyway, it doesn't matter where they yeah, are. But yeah. they're, they're finding their way back. Um. And but it was it was actually, again for me personally, I saw wolves in Yellowstone, but it actually wasn't the wolf that got me interested. It was a conversation that took place next to me with a group of wolf watchers that mm -hmm. really got me hooked on the. Actually, this is really interesting because you've got all of that stuff you've yeah. just described. People going, are we too close? Is it dangerous? Yes. You know, what are these animals? There was a huge amount of, of ignorance towards the mm -hmm. animal that these people were watching. Yeah. Um, and not a small amount of fear. And then as a consequence of that, and this is how Tooth and Claw came about, you know, I spent, and with my colleagues, spent a lot of time talking to ranchers, to, to tourism operators, to outfitters, mm -hmm. to hunters, to, to researchers, not specifically about wolves, but about attitudes towards wolves. Yeah. And that really started to fascinate me. Why do people mm. think the way they think? Why do they feel the way they feel? Yeah. And and what I've learned since then is that if you if you take that from American American people with wolves yeah. to Scottish people with <coughs> pine martins or seals or whatever, yeah. all the same stuff starts to, to percolate to the surface. All this deep seated Yeah. And so often it's actually not about wolves or pine martins. It's about what they represent. So if you just to, to explain what I mean by that, yeah. if you I remember interviewing a gamekeeper about hen harriers 
for those people that don't know, hen harriers is a bird of prey that, that regularly takes red grouse, yes. which of course is the thing that people want to shoot. Yeah. And so there's this really, really divisive, contentious um, situation that exists between proponents of driven grouse shooting in Scotland mm -hmm. and those that think it should be banned for all sorts of reasons, long story. Yes. But I, I interviewed this gamekeeper about harriers and said, what, what is it? What, what is your problem with hen mm -hmm. harriers? And for two sentences, he said, my problem is that they eat red grouse and my job depends on creating harvestable surpluses of red grouse, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's logical. Yes. So that bird is impacting on my job in this way. I get that. Which impacts his putting bread on the table. Exactly. So, so that is all completely logical and rational. Yep. But, but very, very, very quickly, the hen harrier was, was dropped and all of a sudden it was what the hen harrier represented. So, of course... The big problem here, as the finger starts getting jabbed in my chest, the big problem here is the establishment. It's Scottish Natural Heritage. It's RSPB. It's the bunny huggers. It's the vegans. Yeah, it's, the, yeah. it's the academics. It's the townies. It's all of these people that don't understand my life and my lifestyle. They are trying to inflict sure. on me something I don't want. Yeah. So the fear of change, especially when yeah. that change was being imposed upon them, mm -hmm. manifested in a hatred for hen harriers. In the same way that a rancher's hatred for wolves would manifest. It's yeah. not wolves. It's the federal government that want to dictate yeah. to me, that want to put tariffs on my stock, that want to change the legislation, that want to impact on me. Yeah. These are the people that are my enemy. The wolf is the is just the pawn that gets caught in the middle. Yeah. So it was really interesting. And that's really kind of people's value systems and the way they mm -hmm. look at the world and why they look at the world that way is really what, what has fascinated me. So it's, it's actually not wolves, it's people's understanding and perceptions yeah. of wolves. Like, like your uncle. Yeah. Um, you know, that's interesting to me that he would imagine a situation where he sprains his ankle and then he's in danger. Yeah. I think, okay, that's interesting. Why do you think that way? Because yeah. it's not true, it's, it's not, not true. founded, but you've obviously been given some some information, some 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 resource on yeah. which to form that view. Well, he's probably just watched the film. Well, it, well, that happens as well. And we're, I mean, we're back to the media. Yeah, and that, exactly. yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, yeah. It's 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 one of those things. He's probably watched Liam Neeson in the Grey. Yeah. You know? Do you know? Which... <laughs> I remember when that came out, and I was, was like, terrible. oh no, it was you know, terrible. Decades but... of 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 education, just a, a yeah. you know Hollywood blockbuster. It's it's gone out of the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, it's again. It'll be as simple as that. He thinks, well, they're running around there. Yeah, they may eat me. Yeah. So why would I want them to be there? Yeah. You know, yeah. and that's understandable. And, and that's yeah. again in his mind when you're not maybe uh, again. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm not educated. Maybe in the, the subject informed, informed, yeah, yeah. informed. Mm. Uh, you're going to have that mindset again. Yeah. When we went to Utah again, it was, we were now surrounded by all these things. Mm. I remember my mum calling my dad, there's this giant animal outside the house. And my dad's like, what do you mean? And he, she's like, well, it looks like a deer, but it's not a deer. That's, that's a moose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's like, well, it's huge. <laughs> it's like, it's literally the size of the house. Yep. Like, it's looking in the window. <laughs> and uh, she's like, is that going to come in here? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's and then within a couple of years, She's coming driving in on the Jeep uh, into the driveway, and there's this moose who's decided to sit down in the middle yeah, of the driveway. Yeah, yeah. And my mum's like, honking on, get out of the way. Yeah. You know, and then it just gets up and wanders away. Yeah, and yeah. she parks, she gets out of the car, and she just walks into yeah. the house like it's nothing. Well, her familiarization with that situation yeah. has equipped her to deal with it. Yeah. And, and in the same way with, with the sheriff and the black bear. And, and that's the missing bit. Yes. We're not equipped to deal with mm -hmm. these animals because we just don't understand them. We don't know. Yeah. We know very little about them. We've never had to live with them. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they represent a threat. They represent change. They represent danger. Yeah. And, and you know, that is a process if we want these animals back that we have to work harder to, at addressing. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I think the exposure and education and, like you said, being informed of... And Liam Neeson doesn't help. Liam Neeson, you're not helping us, Liam. <laughs> He's really not. You're not helping us. You, you need to do an, a different film where <laughs> wolves help you. Okay. <laughs> That's what we're needing. So, uh, no, I think I, I think the whole thing is very, very fascinating. Um I really hope we can one day have this happen. Um, again, it's a bigger picture. I mm. understand that. Mm. Uh, for me, uh, I'm, like I said I had two Alaskan Malamutes, which is probably about as close as I would get. Well, I was going to gonna say you've lived with wolves, basically. Basically, you know? with wolves. The the neighbour next to us actually had a a, a dog, 
and it was huge. Uh, and it turned out it was 70% timber roof. Yeah, they yeah. have a lot yeah. of that across yeah. there. Yeah. And it was a beautiful dog, yeah. and it would wander. It wandered over to us a couple of times. Um, and my boy, he wasn't too keen on it coming too close. It was another male, and I think he felt threatened with mm. having the female. Mm. But it was a beautiful dog, and it was really nice. Mm. Uh, but it was massive. Mm. It was really big. And I thought, there was a part of me thought, if you had a dozen of them chasing you, you're you're finished. Well, I've, well, <laughs> I've, I've, yeah, that is a fact. That I mean, they're, fact. They're, they're very efficient predators. There's yeah. no doubt about that. But you know, the the the, the biggest irony, I guess, of, of the whole wolf thing in the UK yeah. is is that we're a country of dog lovers. We live with an animal that is ninety nine percent wolf. Now, yeah. when you're looking at a chihuahua, that's difficult to imagine. Yes. But you know, when you're looking at a big a big dog like you've just described, then you know they are they are a a, a, a genetic stone throw away from yeah. from a timber wolf. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we we have this bizarre and 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 completely irrational love of dogs and hatred of wolves or fear of wolves. It's, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, yeah, it's a process and it's a journey and and we're on it. Yeah. 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 No, definitely, definitely. I think it's. Uh, I mean, I don't know. If, I don't know when it's going to happen. Hopefully, it happens in my like I said. Hopefully, it happens in my lifetime to be able to say they're in the Cairngorms mm. or they're wherever mm, they are in, mm, in the Scottish Highlands, mm. or I don't know if there's even areas or parts of England they could go into. I mean, uh, if you look at, again, there's this this perception that wolves need, you know, again, you, you, you imagine them in the Rocky Mountains on the top yeah. of the hill, roaring, again, uh, uh, howling against a, a snow-capped mountain no. backdrop, all of that sort of stuff. They don't need that. No. They need food, yeah. and they need to be left alone. Yeah. And and in Germany, you know, they're, they're, the, the initial, I mean, they've got a lot of packs in Germany now, but um, the initial pack took up residence in a, in a, a military, uh, not bombing range, but a military firing zone. Right. Just because, you know, there was nobody there giving them any hassle. And there were, there yeah. were deer there and hares and rabbits and what have you. And they, they made their living. They've, they've spread now. But yeah. wolves don't... And, and, you know, the most recent development, so to speak, of of, of, of the wolf store in Europe is is they found their way into the Netherlands of all places. That's you right, know, yeah. You know, and, and there's a video on online of a, of a wolf trotting along through a through a park and people yeah. walking their dogs and kids having picnics and yeah. they don't need these big wild places. They just need food and to be left alone. And, yeah. and certainly, Scott, you know, I'm prepared to accept all sorts of objections why they shouldn't be here, but please don't tell me Scotland is too small and, and, yeah. and too many people because if you compare certainly the Highlands um, you know it's one of the least populated areas in yeah. uh, human populated areas in, in Europe so there is space there is food it's yeah. just down to to our willingness or otherwise to have them here yeah I think uh, it's probably still a, a long rocky road uh, but hopefully Scotland big picture will get there and hopefully well, we're doing stuff with links. We've just started a, pro a project about uh, about links, which oh, uh, cool. will will probably hit the headlines in the next two or three months. Okay. Um, that's a much lower hanging fruit than, right. than wolves. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, if you look at it logically, if we're prepared to have beavers back as a component of yeah. the engine, if we're p potentially prepared to have links back as a component of the engine, then why not make the engine as fully full. functional as possible? Exactly, and that includes other animals. And as where well. would the the links? Where would you, if again you're you're saying you're, you've started down that process? Where do you think they would be allocated? Where do you think they would go? So research that was done um, a few years ago now. I mean, these these are very different animals to to, to wolves. They're a, they're yes. a solitary animal. Yep. They're an ambush hunter. Um, mm -hmm. They don't hunt in packs. They they have huge ranges. Yeah. So links are never going to be very visible. They're never you know no. you could very easily live in lynx country and never see one yeah but they need woodland so so it'd have to be a, a, a an area that is extensively wooded the cairngorms is one potential area places like argyle loch lomond some places in loch lomond would be possible right. um but the research that's been done suggests that the prey availability and the habitat availability right now mm -hmm. bearing in mind there's a big drive towards increased forestation in scotland yeah. um would would support around about 400 lynx Wow. Um, north of the of the of the central belt, and then across the forested areas of of southern Scotland, probably mm -hmm. about fifty, which is really marginal in terms of viability. Yeah. But but certainly in the Highlands, four hundred ish. Wow. Yeah. I I mean I'm saying wow, four hundred. That may be still a low number, uh, but 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're not going to go and trap 400 and just dock no, them no, in there. No, no, no. How long would it take? How long would it take to get to that? Would yeah, that take a few decades to get up. Oh to yeah, that? no, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And ag- and again, you've got to take into account there'll be there'll be a certain amount of persecution. That's almost yeah. inevitable. There'll be road traffic accidents. There might be yeah. disease. So you know, this is a, not an animal that that breeds prolifically. No. Um, but feasibly, if again, if you if all of those things are are not necessarily eliminated, but 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 minimized then you know after 50 years you would have a potentially you would have a viable uh, lynx population and how many would you need to to start that out do you think well the the the, the receive wisdom generally now with reintroductions and again we've we've learnt lessons through sure. mistakes over the years um, i remember when well, I say I remember, it was just a little bit before my time but um, when the first sea eagles were reintroduced onto fair isle um, and they brought two over Right. You know, one of them died and one of them flew back to Norway. So that, you know, you kind of learn a lesson from that. So <laughs> generally speaking, the more animals you can get a population started with, yeah. the better. But with lynx, you know, you as you say, you can't have crate loads of them. No. They're difficult to catch. Yeah. You've got to find donor populations from different areas. So there's yeah. genetic diversity. So, you know, in answer to your question, I, I'm guessing now others might correct me, but you'd probably start off with a phased release over maybe five years of right. say 10 animals per year something right. like that okay. yeah so you'd get up to that sort of as you said the 50 mark 50 ish and, and by that time you know animals that were released in year one would have started to breed and, yeah. and so that the, the system starts the but system starts yeah right. some something like that right yeah. and would that be a a similar thing for the wolf i guess you would do it in packs would it be done in a pack situation? For yes. Wolf? Yeah. So what they did in Yellowstone, were, as, as you probably know, is again gathered animals from more or less the same sort of area, but from yeah. different packs again to ensure genetic diversity. That those that those wolves were basically housed together in a yeah. in a release zone for a long time, uh, for a short time, should I say, and then and then released, and then they went off and formed two or three individual packs. Yeah. They bred and spread accordingly. Um, wolves are a little bit different because, of course, they're a social animal. They yeah. they, they rely on pack structure, yeah. whereas lynx don't. So you'd have to think about it slightly differently. Mm-hmm. But again, generally speaking, the more donor animals you have, the better the likelihood of like, success. Of success, yeah. 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 That's fantastic. Yeah, because we have a huge deer population, and you'll you'll know better than me that they've, they they one of too much of one animal is devastating you know like in scotland here we just have hundreds of thousands i think the last count i was told then was about eight hundred thousand or something like that yeah give or take yeah ish i mean yeah that's red and roe deer which are yeah. the two, two but the the again i think there are two very at the moment at least quite divisive um uh I, I hesitate to use the word debates because they're they're, mm-hmm. they're more than that really. But one is around driven grouse shooting and, right. and the ethics and the the economics and the mo- and everything around that. Sure. And the second one is around um, red deer, and they're both, of course, models of of the Victorian sporting uh, yes. era, um, and and have remained unchanged pretty much over the mm-hmm. last sort of two hundred years or so. Um, so yes, on the one hand, there are traditionalists who who would argue that a traditional stalking estate still has a place in the highlands and, yeah. and that it brings social and economic benefit blah blah and then there are other people that say exactly that that you know without a main predator these animals have been have proliferated and are now heavily impacting in yeah. certain areas at least on on native vegetation and, and preventing the the potential for forest to regenerate etc and it's been showed in places like glenfeshi abernethy and other places where deer numbers have been r- brought right down this is yeah. not about eliminating no, deer by any not. means um it's bringing balance. It's bringing balance, but, but again, you know that word. But your balance might be different <laughs> to mine. Might be different to somebody else's. Yeah, uh, true. But nevertheless, there are yeah significantly higher deer numbers now in in the Highlands in particular, and and a, across the Lowlands as well in in terms of roe deer, than there have been in living memory. Yeah. And, and apart from anything else, if you just put aside the 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 whole values and and tradition of the of it, you know, these are expensive animals to accommodate they yeah. they they you know in forestry terms in road accident yeah. terms so you know that it's costing the public purse yeah. significant amounts of money mm-hmm. for this for this level of of certainly in the case of of deer for that level of population to to persist so again it's a challenge that that has much more to do with people mm-hmm. than it has to do with deer again they yeah. find themselves as the political pawn in the middle of all this but again, um, you know, we, we can't carry on just just ignoring no. the fact that deer no. populations are 
proliferating. Yeah. Across the whole of Britain, but, but yeah. in the Highlands, well, across Scotland in, in particular. In particular, yeah, 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 no, definitely. And just one quick thing about your, the, the, the Lynx project you're involved in. Is, uh, how, now again, this may be just how long is a piece of string. How long do you think, from when you've started this, you know, trying to get the mm. links introduced, how long do you have an idea? Of, do you have any idea how long you think it might take you? Um, that that really does come down to politics. Um, yeah. Ultimately, the cabinet minister, who at the moment is Rosanna Cunningham, mm -hmm. would make a decision based on an application mm -hmm. that would be made through Scottish Natural Heritage yeah. or via Scottish Natural Heritage. Uh, it would be her decision. Let, let's be honest, that decision, rightly or wrongly, for better or worse, at the sure. moment is going to be based as much on a political mm -hmm. will or lack of it yeah. as, as an ecological understanding. And that's right. no disrespect to, no, to no, Rosanna I... Cunningham. But she will have detractors in her ear saying, over my dead body. Yeah. Um, and equally, she'll have supporters in her other ear saying yes please get it done. Uh, and yeah. she has to decide what is in the best interests of of scotland yeah and you know i i would argue that perhaps by the time this process comes to that point rosanna cunningham will no longer be cabinet secretary and somebody else will have that decision yeah. so ultimately again rightly or wrongly it will be a political decision yeah um and and you know from my point of view the more people that are informed about the discussion and are engaging mm -hmm. in it in a constructive respectful yeah. open dialogue the better because the last thing that a politician wants is to see this as a rammy that's just going to you know pit town versus country rural yeah. all of those cliched silos because that just spells hassle for them yeah so if you can go with a well-presented community-led proposal where you have majority consensus you're never going to get universal consensus that says you know there's a community in argyle that really wants to champion this they yes. see it as a huge opportunity in terms of ecotourism etc yeah. etc um and and you know this consultation process suggests that people within 100 miles of that are, are generally speaking in favor that makes her decision or his decision whoever it is at the time yeah makes that decision a, a lot, lot easier. easier whereas if they just see conflict then it's much easier for them just to say i'll tell you what Let's leave it. Okay. Well, so we'll see. We'll see. Peter Cairns, thank you for coming on. Last word, what should we do? What can we do, even if it's just even in our gardens? Or what can people do? Think like a mountain. Think that, like that's a mountain. what I would say. Okay. I'd, I'd say, you know, think about the bigger picture. Think about our reliance on nature. We're not, a, we're not separate from it. We're part of it. Yeah. We're reliant on it. It is reliant on us. Think about those those relationships and, yeah, don't go, you know, hatred, going on hate battles with the slug for eating your lettuce yeah. or the, you know, the mole for digging up your prize lawn or whatever. There's a big picture out there and we mm -hmm. all have to play a part in it. Fantastic. Peter Cairns, thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Shoot it, fat boy!